Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the last but one session and then we have our closing address. I'm very impressed with the expertise that uh, KSI have managed to gather today. Uh, uh, and I must admit that uh, I'm meeting them all for the first time. And we had a good pre-council meeting outside, which was very useful. Uh, and what we are going to talk about is uh, about the success in global markets about SMEs. This is a big challenge for SMEs because as much as we may be doing well in the Malaysian market, how can we go across to the border and be successful? This is a major challenge. And because of that, we have got a nice panel. And if I may briefly introduce uh, Tansri Yong, who is the chairman of Slango, Royal Slango. Uh, and I have a little story to share about uh, Royal Slango. In the 80s, when I used to be a relationship manager, those days we have syndication signing, you know. And the momentum we give after syndication signing will always be a, a Royal Slango uh, uh, items, mementos, you know, where we inscribe which ceremony, who are the bankers and all that. Now, those days, of course, they were still in Jalan Tuanku, Abdurrahman. Now they are in big malls like KLCC, etc. And then coming, going to Melbourne in the 80s, I was invited for a, by the EY partners in Melbourne for a dinner. And I thought, what should I get for the partners in EY? Then I bought them all a Royal Slango beer mug, thinking that it will be something unique for them. But to my surprise, when I went to Collins Street and was walking to EY's office, there I saw Royal Slango's showroom. I was so surprised. I said, oh my God, I thought this uh, beer mug is going to be something very unique, but they already have a showroom in, in Melbourne. So that's how the branding of Royal Slango has been globally. That is one factor. Number two is they have also managed to survive for four generations. How many Malaysian companies can we think of that have lasted almost a hundred years? Almost, I, I don't think we have any. If at all, we can count them with our fingers. So that is our first panelist. Number two, we have Dr. S.K. Lingam, another uh, baby boomer like me, uh, who has been uh, uh, spending a lot of time in London promoting uh, uh, SMEs in the UK, gathering our students who are studying there, and then helping them, and then being a bridge between Malaysia and UK to share the SME, uh, development and that so that is his expertise which he will share and then we have uh, Shovan uh, who is uh, the CEO of the American Malaysian Chamber and we will get from her her experience of how she considers Malaysian SMEs uh, here and what how better we can perform overseas and then we will get to hear from her. And finally, we have Rizal, who is the SME Corp CEO, a very bright engineer from Imperial College. I was very impressed. I thought uh, GLCs do not hire the brightest and the best, but that is, uh, I was very impressed and surprised that uh, now we have someone in the SME from Imperial College who will be able to share his experience of what are the challenges of getting our SMEs to go international and then export our products overseas? So with that summary, maybe I should start with Tanisri uh, to share your, your story, your success story over the last uh, 
generations and how you have managed to sustain and what lessons we can learn from you and what you would like to pass on to the future generations in the SME industry in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vaseha. Well, we have a long history, so I may talk too much. Please stop me <laughs> when is the appropriate time. Yes, uh, as uh, Dr. Vaseha has mentioned, uh, we have a long history. We started the company when my grandfather came in 1885 because Malaya at that time, even in those days, was producing half of the world's supply of tin. You imagine a small little peninsula. And tin is the basic material for pewter. So that's how we started. And of course, uh, we went through the world wars, you know, including the Japanese occupation, where we actually had to stop. But thereafter, we followed the industrialization program of the country. You know, we have the Investment Incentives Act 1968, whereupon the government began to have a series of assistances or help, which I think is important for SMEs as they grow. Uh, for example, I can still remember 68 NPC, they call it the National Productivity Center, was first started. And uh, I was still in high school, you know, at that time, uh, wanting to do engineering. And I was so impressed by the experts that they brought in from the ILO. You know, this old gentleman with white hair would come look at your factory and immediately in the same afternoon help to draw your factory layout and design machines for you. So those were some of the practical uh, assistance that government could help SMEs to grow. And on top of that, all the incentives in terms of double deduction for advertising, you know, when you advertise overseas, you can claim the expenses twice over, which means that uh, the cost for you to actually do it is much reduced. And that helped us in the 70s to export to Australia, to England, where we began to sell to some of these department stores overseas. So much so that after a few years, in the 80s or so, we began to set up our own warehousing and distribution, whereupon we employ our own sales agents to supply to all the various uh, department stores. Then the next step was you begin to open up your own retail shops. And that's how our good moderator found our shop in Collins Street, I believe it is, uh, on the way to the railway station at uh, the Block Arcade. And uh, step by step, that is how we began to increase our distribution to different countries in the world. But fundamental to that is, for any SME or mid-tier companies to grow and export, they must have a strong domestic base. Because that is from there that they are able to derive the funds and the profits to finance the uh, overseas uh, operations. There is no doubt exporting is not an easy thing because uh, while you may be your, a, a, a big fish in a small bowl in your own country, the moment you go overseas, you are really fighting with the world's best and the quantity is much more than you. I remember my first visit to the Frankfurt Fair you know, we, we have a trade fair here. We think like PWTC is grand, right? We have big, plenty of exhibitors. But if you go to the Frankfurt Fair, it's like 20 PWTCs in a big ground. And as you walk through each hall, each hall is a specialist in the place. This hall could be all, uh, you know, uh, glassware. The next hall could all be about ceramics. And the next hall could be about lighting. So when you walk through such halls, then you know how small you are in relation to the world market. And that's why you have to be very good. You got to, your quality must be first rate and your pricing must be right. And in this way, then you slowly begin to expand from country to country. And while talking about uh, exporting to other countries, the various trade agreements that the Malaysian government signs up is very important. I think Sion just now at our pre-council meeting is like, talk, what do we do with the recent trade agreements that we have signed, RCEP and CPTPP? 
these are quite important ones. But uh, to me, the more impactful one is the CPTPP. And I'm so glad that the government has withstood the last minute criticisms and gone ahead to ratify and gazette it. Because that will be a game changer for us, uh, not only to the exporters, but also to the importers and also to the men in the street in this country. Because CPTPP brings in, number one, for the exporters, suddenly just three countries which we don't have any trade relations with. There is Canada, Mexico and Peru. We never have any trading with them. And many of the naysayers say, oh, it doesn't matter because they're only 2 or 3% of our trade. Yes, of course, because we never have any trade agreements with them. They are very high duties. You know, but now with just three, three countries, their GDP is 10 times that of Malaysia. Just like the whole of ASEAN is 10 times that of Malaysia. If we consider the ASEAN market important, we should also consider just these three countries just as important. And we already signed it. So all of us must begin to take advantage of it. I know there was a plastic manufacturer, so some of you may know Cipro. They said, I went to Mexico, I can compete with them, my plastic products. But there's a 15, 20% duty. If you are an exporter, you're going to sell your barang, say it's a 100 ringgit barang, and then because you're going to add 20% on top, you become 120. Whereas the other guys who produce with 80, 90, or 100. So with this removed, then you are able to export your products. And if you can export to Mexico, it is amazing. Because even though the US is outside, there's a free trade agreement between Mexico and the United States, which is huge. So you could be a part supplier or supply some things to, to Mexico and incorporate our products and go to the United States. So I'm so glad that CPTPP is confirmed and is going on. And from what I hear from MITI, the number of applications from the private sector for country of origin requests or a cost analysis reports for them to qualify to go to CPTP is much more than any other trade agreements that we have signed. So this is a matter of months. So the positive impacts on trade agreements on SMEs, mid-tier companies, or companies in general is important. And I think that as the uh, number of countries or number of companies begin to go for export, free trade agreements will be important and they are a big help. And I'm sure SME Corp and Mart Trade and all this will help the local business community to take advantage of this. That is how we took advantage of some of the trade incentives. And I think now with the incentives in place, and the trade agreements in place, I think we have a very good chance to progress further. That's my eight minutes. You know? Thank you. Thank you, Sanchari. Uh, and uh, <coughs> you. Yeah, you almost are perfectly on time. <laughs> yeah, later maybe we can have a session, question and answer from the floor. Now, Dato S K Lingam, uh, you could share your views of what we discussed at the meeting, how you are going to impart your work which you have been doing to promote SME development between Malaysia and the UK and Europe generally. Thank you. Good. Good afternoon to all of you. First of all, with the permission of the moderator, I'd like to extend our warmest congratulations to Tansri Mike Yo and his team for their untiring efforts and selfless sacrifice in staging a successful organ event. Let's give them a warm reception. Country Michael and I go back many years and we often jointly organize events, similar uh, type of events in the UK, promoting Malaysia into UK and in Europe. Coming to the point, yes, I'm a Malaysian, still a Malaysian.
and everything, except one thing, if the country is at war, I don't have to pick up arms and defend the king of UK uh, because my allegiance is still to the king of Malaysia. <laughs> okay, I went there many, many years ago. I don't want to reveal my age, but <laughs> went there to study law, read first degree at uh, an institution called London School of Economics, then did my master's at uh, University College London, where to my credit, I won a book prize, and then went and did the bar, qualified as a barrister, called to the English bar, decided to practice in the UK against my father's wish, but I don't look back. I'm looking back, I don't regret it. Yes, had a modicum of success in the criminal bar as a barrister, then uh, because we have in the UK, unlike in Malaysia, the jury system, so sometimes you lose cases, not simply because the jurors based their decision on the facts of the case, but more they let other external factors like racism and so forth to interfere cloud their sense of judgment. So there was some disappointment. Then I left that and went into the commercial bar, practiced as a commercial lawyer, then stepped out and became a commercial consultant. And till today, I, I remain as a commercial consultant, using my legal and commercial knowledge, helping um, foreign companies to make a foray into the UK and Europe, and likewise uh, UK companies making a foray into Malaysia, ASEAN. In the process, 26 years ago, we had in ASEAN the financial crisis, major financial crisis. Many of us in my age group and Dan Sri's age group may remember that and we suffered in the whole of Malaysia, in ASEAN, and especially in Malaysia. So the governments of the day in ASEAN got together 26 years ago, told the ambassadors in our UK, guys, work and collaborate with the Malaysian and ASEAN diaspora. And this is where I was telling my good friends earlier on, pre-conference discussion, why the ASEAN diaspora there can be your foot soldier, can be of great assistance to you guys. If you want to make a foray, a penetration into that region, in the UK and in Europe, because we can share with you our experiences. So we can, cut the aggravation, the time, and the money you will spend in achieving your objectives. And, the, and then the ambassadors got together and formed the ASEAN UK Business Forum, which is a voluntary pro bono organization. Each country has one representative, and 26 years ago, my 10th High Commissioner elected me to represent Malaysia. I was elected as the first chairman and remained elected and unopposed for 26, 16 years. And since then, now I am the life president. It is a pro bono, we do it voluntarily. It's all run by ASEAN professionals, giving our services and time to the community of our own ASEAN diaspora, not those in London, but also overseas. And then similarly, in 13, 14 years ago, the then High Commissioner of Malaysia got together and formed the Malaysia Link UK. I am the ch first chairman, and till today, I remain the chairman. Last year, June 9th, we celebrated 26th anniversary of the ASEAN Forum, 25, 
and the 15th anniversary of Malaysia in UK at the House of Lords. We had seven ASEAN ambassadors, five law lords, the Prime Minister of UK, uh, his trade envoy as our guest of honour, together with our my own High Commissioner from Malaysia. And we also celebrated the, the Queen's, the late Queen's uh, Jubilee celebrations as well. And uh, our main brief is simple, to help SMEs and Malaysian companies and ASEAN companies, individuals and corporations, to make a foray into that part of the world because as I tell the students whom I mentor, you must always have a global mindset. Define global mindset, that means you don't orbit just around your own Malaysians or others, but mix with locals and foreigners. That's very important, you learn a lot. And likewise, I'm telling all you SME, Malaysian corporate, corporate Look to USA, UK, Europe. Don't orbit just in Malaysia because 32 million, 33 million, fine. But penetrating the UK and the Europe, you have wider opportunities for your product and services. And what's great about it, as I told you, under Malaysia Link UK, we can help you. We have the professional team to help you all the way with the minimum of cost and the maximum of return. Our motto is simple, minimum outlay, maximum returns. How, are, how am I for time? All right. Okay, on that note, I yield to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you. The key message from Dr. Lingam is SMEs who want to penetrate international markets in Europe or UK, please get his contact and work with him. And that I think that's the gist of your message that I get. Yeah. And now we'll come to our third speaker, Ms. Shoman Das the CEO of uh, American Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, a very powerful chamber. Uh, let's share her experience vis-a-vis -vis the Malaysian SMEs, where we stand and how we could improve our market share across the world. Thank you very much um, for the invitation by KSI and also for the warm welcome here. When I got the invitation to come and speak at this panel, I looked at it and said, what am I doing in this group? Um, I'm from the American Ch Malaysian Chamber of Commerce. The majority of our membership is uh, our MNCs. There are very few, if any, SMEs in our, in our organization. And I was thinking, okay, what can I contribute towards this? And I think, you know, I think, and then I remembered about maybe um, yesterday night, I started off in Malaysia as an SME. I had my own company. It was a film company. Most people don't realize I came from a film background, but as a small film company, I started my own company. Um, I persuaded my father to let me have one of his little quiet dormant companies. I negotiated with him a price for it. And, and from that built up my own little empire working in Malaysia, but very quickly realized that I, in order to be successful, I needed to look outside. So I needed to find got jobs that I wanted to be aligned with, or products that I wanted to be aligned with, that I could say I was proud to be aligned with. And I had to go outside, whether I went to Singapore or to Hong Kong, or, and to make my name outside in order to make myself more successful in Malaysia. So I think it's having, uh, for SMEs to succeed, the first thing I think we all need to understand is we need to really consider what is it that we want to achieve, and whether we have the appetite and the courage to go abroad and if we do have the courage to go abroad, to take it on ourselves to understand that market. Because in order to go abroad, as um, Tansri said, you, you, go, you may be a big fish here and recognize and everybody knows you and it's easy to get a job um, or you get, a, to get your product into market. 
But the moment you step outside your border, it becomes much harder. You realize that you are not just a small fish, you're a little minnow. And no one knows who you are. So how do you make yourself known? So I think with SMEs um, going out to, to, into the world, Malaysia has a tremendous advantage in the fact that we've got 100 years, if not more, um, of history of good, solid business products, and we can take them to the international market. But we need to find, the first of all, the willpower inside us. The second thing is how do we attack the market? Understanding the market today, and not the market when you started the company. You may have started the company 10 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe it was your father's company or your mother's company, and you've taken it over. But it, today's world is so changed, especially in the last two years. It's a completely different place. So how do we prepare um, to go into that market? And I think, um, as, as um, Tansri touched on as well, there's so many different elements that now are impacting SMEs and um, tr the trade, the, the trade environment. We have so many new trade agreements with different countries. Sadly, not one with the US. Uh, we're still working on it. We're trying to make sure we can get bigger ties. But it was very, uh, very sad that the, um, the US pulled out of TPP because I think that was a lost opportunity for both countries. But as, um, as Sanjay said, the CTPTPP through the countries that are involved still offers access to the US market. And you have to then figure out a little bit more complicated, maybe less direct, but you have access. Um, it's a question of getting there. But it's becoming much more complicated. The world of trade facilitation is getting complicated. We have RCEP, we have the bilaterals. I think Malaysia has 47 bilaterals, if not more, um, that Malaysia has signed. We, as an exporter or a company that wants to export, you need to have that knowledge in your, in your house. And if it isn't in your house, where can you get it? Is it, is it, uh, is it from outfits um, that, you know, that, that um, Dutt, Dutt talked about in the UK? Is it from outfits here locally, whether it's SME Corp or the multitude of um, industry associations? Where can you find that and demand it of them? I mean, I truly think you have the right to demand that information from your association to help you navigate the world today because it is very complicated. And trade facilitation, a lot of the things that you need to understand is in the world of trade facilitation. We have CPTPP. How many SMEs have actually sat down and said, what do I have access to today as part of um, CPTPP? And if I want that access, what standards do I need to prove that I can actually address that market? Is it, um, is it a, being able to reach the global standards on a particular product, your know, ISOs and all, and all that stuff? Or is it the ESG standards that are coming up? Are you operating in a, in a framework that is acceptable in today's world, which is you have to be very conscious of your environmental impact Am I having impact on my environment? And if I, if I am and have done, what am I doing to remediate that and present a different picture? Um, and the same thing with social. Am I treating my workers correctly? Am I, am I treating not just the, um, the foreign workers, but my Malaysians as well? You know, we have laws that are changing. ILO uh, our standards are coming in. Um, maternity leave, paternity leave, um, shorter hours, uh, overtime. Wage, uh, wage um, inflation in some, some what well, people are calling wage inflation, some people are just calling a decent wage. You know, um, I read a story the other day that someone came, they started, when they started in the 1970s, their starting salary was 1300. When their son started 30 years later, the starting salary was only 2300. I mean, how do you justify that? It needs to be much harder, 30 years. So how do we, we as SMEs, we need to be all looking as, what is today's market and how do we address it? But the other thing is also being cognizant of the policies that this government are um, writing for you to work within. Which, how are they writing the, 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 the rules and regulations that you, you um, operate in? Um, when, we, when I first came into Ancham, one of the first things I had to deal with was the withholding tax, which uh, we luckily, or should I say, with through a lot of effort from a num number of bodies, managed to get um, zeroed out. It hasn't been removed, it's still on the books. And this is for the use of uh, services abroad, but being billed through Malaysia. So what it, people didn't realize, it impacted every single 
local company that was trying to sell abroad. So if you wanted to hire a marketing company in France because your product was going to go to France, you would be charged 10% extra, even though that, that, that person helping you was not even in the country. So the question is, you know, what was that rule doing there? And it really damaged, I think, a lot of expansion for SMEs and a lot of Malaysian companies. Now, we, we damaged, it was a problem for us because we don't have a double taxation committee uh, treaty with the US. So we were impacted by that, but it also had this very, very uh, unseen consequent for local companies. And that was not, it was, it was something that, so you need to watch the guardrails of policies as they get made and how they're going to affect you. And you need to be much more, your company needs to be much more observant of what's happening around those policies. So again, understand the markets you want to go into, understand what it takes for you to get there, but also understand the policies and the policy makers intent so that you don't get, and, and, and lobby, lobby through your associations to make sure that, that those, um, those guardrails are not going to be too restrictive for you. There have to be guardrails in some areas, but they shouldn't be too restrictive for allowing Malaysian companies to go abroad. And I would say on policies as well, I think you know there's a lot of um, um, enabling technologies that are available today that young SMEs or new SMEs are going to have to adopt um, in order to move down in this direction. Make sure that the government knows that you want to have this enabling technologies without tariffs so that you can access them. So that you have access to, you know, if, 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 there, were tech, if there was taxation on half the components on this phone or even on the phone, we wouldn't have the mobile phone as we would today. So there are a number of, there are a number of um, uh, enabling technologies, 3D printers, um, ESG uh, uh, monitors and stuff like that. We need to make sure we have access to that, a lower tariff, if no tariff at all, so that you can grow, so that SMEs can actually make sure that they um, can have access to the world market um, by the, the policies that we have in country. But ultimately, it is our responsibility as SMEs here to take that. And it's just to want to say on a, on a closing note here, because I'm sure I'm running out of time, um, Malaysian SMEs do very well, and, MS, and, and the, the larger, the MSMEs, have done very well. Um, local Malaysian companies um, have benefited from FDI. The American FDI, the American uh, um, investors here have raised, trained so many thousands of Malaysians enable them to start their own companies as SMEs and go on to be large companies like Anari, Pentamaster. These are all, you know, everybody started as an SME, but they've grown. So look and, look and see how they've grown. Look and see how those Malaysian companies succeeded and ask them the questions. Go, ask them, how did you do it? You know, they will be willingly share. How did you make that? What was the decisions in the early days? Um, and, and I would say, you know, um, there are other, other companies like, um, I think there's a social enterprise called BGBG as well that's making inroads. Be innovative. Take something that you, you care about, but take it abroad. But, you know, ultimately it comes down to how hungry you are and how observant you want to be and how successful you want to be. Understand your market going forward. And there is help. So with that, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shovan. And uh, we will reserve some of the comments for because we have good time for the concluding session. So we we'll reserve the comments and question and answer. Now we have uh, SME Corp. Uh, Rizal, the CEO, is almost like the ambassador for the SME Corp. I mean, you have a big uh, weight on your shoulders, and uh, please give us your views on how. SMEs can contribute to the economy and how we could go abroad, what other things. Give us your story. Thank you, uh, Dr. Basihar. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. And uh, I would like to thank KSI for inviting me as one of the panelists here. Uh, well, uh, perhaps I just give a brief, uh, I mean, a brief uh, so called what is SME Corp uh, all about. Yeah? SME Corporation Malaysia is an agency under the Ministry of Entrepreneur and Cooperative Development. Yeah? And one of our focus areas yeah, is about to internationalize MSMEs. Yeah? We have six functions, but what I would like to focus today is more on internalization of MSMEs. Uh, before I go deeper in terms of 
the challenges because before we want to know or we want to go abroad, we need to address the constraints, the concerns, the challenges that facing the MSMEs to go abroad. Yeah, there are many constraints, there are many challenges. But before that, I would like to put into perspective um, the scenario of uh, export market but contribute by MSMEs uh, in Malaysia. In 2021, yeah, our export uh, grew about 5.4%. That goes about 124.9 billion ringgit, uh, representing about 11.7% in 2021. As we know, certainly pandemic COVID-19 has actually really affected the economy and especially to MSMEs. And even until now, we haven't come to the base of 2019 export value, which is about 179 billion. Yeah. We are like still below. Yeah. So there is a big uh, so-called uh, task, huh? especially for the MSMEs uh, to actually go abroad and do export and contribute to the economy. And we know that uh, uh, the non-MSMEs, especially the MNCs, the large firms, has grown stronger, 24.9% in 2021. Yeah? And that makes the share coming from the non-MSMEs become bigger, about 88.3%. Yeah? We used to have 17 to 18% of uh, share from MSMEs contribute to the economy. And we have a target by 2025 that MSMEs need to contribute 25%. So it's a huge and tall order for MSMEs to do that. But we have a framework, we have strategies, as we know that the concern and the challenges that they are facing is more about lacking in terms of participation uh, of MSMEs in the internationalization activities, yeah? as well as the low uh, participation in terms of global value chain by MSMEs. Yeah? And uh, we also know that uh, challenges like uh, adoption of technology, digitalizations are still lacking among the MSMEs. We did a uh, study with uh, one, of, uh, one of the technology players as well in 2018, uh, looking into where are MSMEs uh, in terms of digitalizations. And we found out that uh, more than 80% of MSMEs in Malaysia, yeah, they have all the gadgets they have, like the smartphones, laptops, uh, smartwatch, uh, all those gadgets, yeah, more than 80%. Well, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, however, they, in terms of digitalization of their business process, they are about or less than 20%, meaning that the front end and back end systems are not being adopted and that makes them less in terms of productivity and will not move them forward when it comes to become a global uh, player. So these are challenges that we know on the ground and um, we may, I mean the government has uh, some programs including SME Corp Malaysia when it comes to how we would like to digitalize and to make the SMEs more sustainable and then to become a global player. Yeah? And uh, other than that, uh, access to financing, when it comes to new growth uh, MSMEs and startups, also a challenge. So uh, for them, I believe uh, some of you are, you know, uh, New, uh, new, new, new businesses who like to get financing, and that always be a challenge because there is no uh, track record, and the characteristic of traditional banks, yeah, would like to see more uh, proven records, uh, not for uh, less than three years. For example, uh, SMEs who would like to go beyond and expand their business overseas. So, so that's an, uh, another challenge. Another challenge, of course, the the connectivity. Uh, I think we know that uh, uh, perhaps in KL or Klang Valley is not so much, but if we go in other states, for example, like in Sabah, in Sarawak, the, uh, uh, not the urban areas, but the, the outskirts, still have problems. To connect to the suppliers, to connect to the buyers, is something that we need to look into as well. Yeah? So these are challenges. Uh, that they need to look into before they move themselves to become a global player. 
And uh, once we address these concerns and challenges, then we know how to tackle that. And in SME Corp Malaysia, we have our five focus areas. And three of that focus areas are about uh, uplifting the MSMEs to become uh, high growth, innovative, uh, sustainable uh, MSMEs uh, in the form of uh, looking into how we actually develop value chain in certain industries, for example, like the smart agriculture, uh, oil and gas, electrical electronics, medical devices, yeah, uh, tourism, and, and others. Yeah? So these are high impact industries that uh, we would like to focus on, aligning with the 12th Malaysian plan. And uh, with these uh, high impact industries, and they have more opportunity in terms of how to get more access to the financing, how to get more access uh, to the information or perhaps uh, market knowledge about countries that they would like to export to. Yeah? And we also uh, look into how to uh, digitalize the high potential micro enterprises. In, in Malaysia, uh, we have about 1.22 million of MSMEs in terms of uh, numbers. Yeah? Out of that 1.22 million, 78.6% are micro enterprises, meaning their turnover, annual turnover is less than 300,000 ringgit a year or less than five employees that they uh, have. Uh, the small and medium are more than that, more than 300,000, uh, up to 50 million uh, in terms of uh, revenue, and uh, five workers until 200 workers. So, so that is the difference between micro and small and medium. And the small and medium consists only about 21-22% uh, out of it. But when it comes to contribution to the economy, they contribute more than 80% when it comes to gross output. I think this is where SME Corp are focusing more on the SMEs uh, for them to go and export abroad. Uh, but we also look into the high potential micro because some of them are startup, tech startups, who can actually expand uh, within three years or less than five years to become uh, bigger play, uh, bigger SMEs uh, in a small or medium scale. Uh, and uh, I think time's up, is it? Okay. Uh, the other thing is about, uh, beside, beside uh, the, the strategies that we put in, focusing on uh, uh, dig digitalization, automation, um, as well as uh, uh, looking into the value chain, yeah? Uh, we also uh, looking into what will be the future proof of MSMEs uh, in the future. Yeah? So one of the elements that been, we are looking now is about the ESG, Environment, Social and Governance uh, uh, Practices or Compliance. Yeah? Uh, we got to know yeah, that uh, maybe in a few years' time, there will be some tax being imposed for products who are not uh, ESG compliant. Yeah? So SMEs need to be prepared on that. Yeah? So awareness level of ESG need to be, uh, to be given to uh, MSMEs and they need to know. Uh, and we also have a program called uh, PKS Lestari, I mean Sustainable SMEs, yeah? uh, where we are looking into how we can uh, give awareness to uh, the MSMEs, especially the ESG element. Also have the ESG assessment or self-assessment for them to, to look where they are in terms of uh, their positions. Yeah? whether they are uh, uh, beginners or whether they are intermediate or advanced. Yeah? So we are doing that and we are working with um, our strategic partners, like, uh, of course, with MITI, of course, with uh, Steering for the standards, as well as with the uh, uh, SC Security uh, Commission on the governance part. Because not only environment that we need to tackle on, but also on the uh, social response, uh, social obligations, for example, like the forced labor, for example. Uh, there are a lot of uh, topics about forced labor that SMEs need to know. For example, you cannot have employees that you restrict their movement, meaning that employers cannot hold their passports. I think in Malaysia, some employees hold their passports just to, for security reason, right? But once ESG compliant been embarked, I think these are things that MSMEs need to know what are the do and don'ts uh, because, as mentioned just now, that we have a lot of FPAs and we never use the opportunity of the FPAs through the SME chapter. The SME chapter will treat our MSMEs better when it comes to 
trading with the entities, for example, uh, in RCEP or CPTPP. And uh, for MSMEs or SMEs chapters, we have about 18 FTAs yeah, uh, that has been signed uh, by Malaysia and with other countries. So FTA advisory will be something that we are looking into as well. I know MITI has that, but these are more for SMEs because they need to know uh, what are there, uh, are there for them. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I think uh, it's about looking into how uh, our MSMEs need to be prepared if crises come again. Yeah, I think the contingency plan uh, I must have by all MSMEs because recently we don't know this pandemic was so impactful when it comes to uh, the the, the neg negativity yeah? uh, part of it. I know uh, the positivity part is digitalization, uh, automation, uh, and an eye opener for them. Uh, but on the negative part is the, what do you do when you actually have that crisis? What is your contingency plan? What is your plan B or plan C yeah? for you to be resilient, for you to be uh, uh, more uh, resistant when it comes to all these crises? And end of the day, is for you to be uh, uh, be there in the market and now to become a global player as well. I think that's uh, for the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. This is the first time in my moderating experience, all the presenters kept almost to their time, and therefore I have some surplus time for question and answer and further discussion. Usually it will be run out of time, either because the previous session overshoots uh, or our pre own session overshoots because the speakers take longer than the allotted time. So please give a round of applause to our speakers for their discipline in keeping to the time. I have taken some notes. I will just brief a little bit and then ask them questions for a few minutes. And then we'll open up to the floor for questions and answers. We started with uh, Tan Sri Yong who said, first you must start with a strong domestic base. Then only you can export. If your foundation is weak, you cannot think of exporting. And then the common thing that came across the three speakers, uh, except for Dr. Lingam, whose, whose uh, mission is different, uh, was trade agreements. The importance of trade agreements and bilateral agreements for the SME so that you can, you know, sell your products easily. So please learn and understand the trade agreements between Malaysia and the various governments and various uh, associations and trade uh, packs that we have entered into for ease of uh, your export market. And then, uh, of course, the, the MNCs are doing a great job because they are big, therefore they have the financial resources to do well and many of the foreign MNCs here are uh, doing a great job because they come with strong product, they come with strong markets which are abroad, so they come, they use Malaysia as a manufacturing base and then they re-export to overseas, etc. And therefore they are in good shape. The challenge is for the SMEs, how we can improve our SME competitiveness to become more challenging to abroad. Then uh, the, of course, Rizal outlined a lot of issues related to the SME talk and how they can uplift the, the, he talked about connectivity, access to financing, digitalization, and uh, also uh, how our information regarding finance, etc., has it been communicated well to the SMEs businesses? And he also distinguished between micro SMEs and then, uh, normal SMEs. So that is two segments within the SME market itself. I presume we are focusing more on the M SMEs. Yeah? And then, of course, we need to, of, many of these micros will one day 
graduates to become uh, MSMEs. So we need, perhaps, I don't know whether the government is focusing anything on the micro enterprises, and maybe we need to develop that. And in my own experience as a banker, I know that government has a lot of concessions, grants, preferred loans, which many SME and micro SMEs do not know. And we, at the end of the day, let's say uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, gives us a hundred million to give out to SMEs for six months. At the end of the six months, we still have surplus funds, which means the SMEs do not take full advantage of the funds offered to them. So please look into the various websites in, in, in Ministry of Finance, etc., to look for what grants are available, what kind of uh, financing is available. And uh, I happen to sit on one of the banks which push, uh, more uh, our vision now and our motive is to expand the SME financing. And if you need help, please, uh, you may be able to contact me. I'm on the, as the independent board of directors of Bank Rajat, which is uh, one of the banks that has been mandated to develop SME. So feel free to reach out to me. So that is probably the, the summary that I, I, I wanted to uh, And I want to maybe go around and ask each one of the participants, uh, based on our discussion, how would you, is there anything that you would like to add on? Thank you. Well, I think it's what you summarize is true. And uh, uh, in addition to your own domestic market, in addition to free trade agreements, it's funny how the image of your own country do affect the chances of you succeeding overseas. I just want to relate uh, uh, in the, I think it's about 40, 50 years ago, when I first started exporting to North America. Uh, the first one was, of course, in New York, you know, Bloomingdale's. I rang up a buyer. I don't know him, I just rang up incognito. And I said, oh, I'm so-and-so from a computer company in Malaysia, and I like to ask. And before he said, I don't want to buy anything from Malaysia. And he just bang down the phone. Now, I don't know what the circumstances were for him to say that, but things like this do happen. Then I went up to Toronto, and there I brought a few stack of uh, samples and laid it out for the buyer of the Hudson's Bay Company, one of the biggest uh, retail chains there. And it was a good meeting. I said, yes, uh, now I would like to place your products in there. That was 1975. And if you remember 1975, America was in a war with Vietnam and they were finishing the war. They were withdrawing. Every night on prime time television, they have helicopters and lifting soldiers out of burning buildings, where it was all coming back to America. They say, Mr. Young, I would like to buy your products, but you are a very established company. Will your country still exist next year? Because they were afraid that if Vietnam fell, Malaya, at the time, Malaysia would also fall. So the impact of uh, the country's image do have an impact upon your success. And uh, if you brought about this question about uh, free trade agreements, there were a lot of naysayers. But you don't miss something until you lose it. You don't miss something until you lose it. Of course, if you don't have a free trade agreement, you don't even miss it because you never had it, all right? Uh, and I'll give you an example, is I think eight or nine years ago. There is prior to this free trade agreement under the United Nations, they have a GSP, a generalized system of preferences whereby the developed countries give duty-free preferences to developing countries. We were a developing country, you know, for 20, 30 years, considered that. And in Europe, they have a GSP preference whereby imports from Malaysia would go into Europe duty-free. We were all exporting nicely. We didn't uh, miss anything. Until about eight years ago, they graduated Malaysia from developing to 
already like that you look. So they remove the preferences. And what happened then? Every company started complaining. I remember, all of you know SKF bearings? They make ball bearings in Milai in Nesarambai. They came, at that time I was in FMM, they were the president then. They came and said, oh, you know, what can we do? What can we do? Because 90% of the bearings that they export goes to the European Union, and suddenly they find themselves faced with a 6% duty. And they were, you know, beginning to lose market share to other countries. So this is an example whereby you do not miss something until you've lost it. So I would like to again tell SMEs, if there are new FTAs, there are certain incentives, certain concessions that we now talk about for SMEs, take advantage of them. Because we have never experienced before, experience it and go to those markets. Otherwise, you know, if one day it's gone, then you begin to miss it. I applaud the panelists. We covered earlier. Right? Free trade, yes, it is relevant. Like when I talk in the UK, why Malaysia, why ASEAN? The lot of advantages coming to Malaysia as a gateway to ASEAN because Malaysia enjoyed free trade agreements with ASEAN and now we have RCEP and so forth. So there are a lot of advantages in this such agreement. But you are, both those of you in the private sector, if you have a product or a particular service, and now we should promote tax services. And we, how we try to help you is to link with other companies who are in the similar space so there can be joint collaboration. UK and Malaysia are promoting actively UK-Malaysia technology collaboration. And we should take advantage of that. Right now, one of my briefs from one of my clients is that, and I'm here talking to one uh, multinational company, and hopefully um, in the next couple of days we will sign a major agreement and hopefully you read about it in the Star newspaper and we probably have the two High Commissioners. The Malaysian High Commissioner to the UK is going to be here in the next few days. The British High Commissioner to uh, Malaysia is a good friend. He's on notice to stand by to witness So collaboration and image perception of the country is important. But that is not so much a bother to the private and corporate sector. How we overcome it is you is who is representing you, who is marketing you. If you come to organizations like the one we are using, Malaysia Link UK, is highly respectable and we can promote you. So you don't have to worry too much about it. Last point is from Lisa. He talked about challenges. I say before you penetrate a new market, you look at three things. Opportunities, challenges, and then the rewards. Don't look at the rewards first. Opportunities, challenges, very important. And every challenge can be overcome, my friend. Nothing is difficult. There are human-made challenges, there are human-made solutions. And that's why you have consultants like us who always come and give you solutions. So, don't fear anything, explore the market, grab the opportunity, and I always say, no time like the present. So, don't ponder, act. Thank you. Just very quickly, um, I just wanted to add to, um, you know, I think what you're saying is it is absolutely you have to, you have to kind of um, take that first step and, and kind of, you know, make the effort to do this. But I also want to just add, there are resources, use them, but they don't always cost you money. Your, 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 um, your, your associations 
don't just always send the owner there. Send your staff into your associations so that they can learn, so that they can bring back that knowledge. Invest in your people in the, in the SME. Give them the training, because sometimes you don't have to go and uh, pay for a consultancy to give you the information of the, 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 uh, the, the trade facilitation. Just simple research, desk research sometimes. You can actually, mm -hmm. somebody be hire a young graduate who will help you learn how to do this. And you know, invest in the people so they can learn and they can also um, grow with your company to become an advocate for you as well. So, but I think you know, it's, it's using those moments, using the opportunities what's in front of you today. There are a lot of um, fresh graduates who don't really know what they want. So there's a talent gap because also they don't know what they want. Give them something else. It's not just if you're manufacturing, give them a role in the manufacturing that maybe gives them a little bit more scope. And so invest in the people. Uh, perhaps uh, I would like to share that uh, under SME Corp Malaysia, uh, we have uh, specific programs that uh, can assist uh, MSMEs to go abroad. Yeah? Uh, but of course, as mentioned just now, you need to know what your challenge is, yeah? uh, what your problems, and we can look into uh, in terms of what will be next. Uh, because we have uh, a program called GlowSmack, it is Global Linkages SME Programs, uh, whereby uh, we uh, facilitate business deals, we facilitate uh, potential deals, yeah? whether it's face-to-face uh, -face or through virtual. And through virtual, we have a, pod a portal called My Assist MSME, and under this My Assist MSME, we have a module called Match Team, where we can actually connect yeah? uh, both parties, uh, the MSMEs, or with the international, uh, another MSMEs, or with the anchor players as well. Uh, it's just for, for them to meet up, yeah, uh, to know each other before going ahead for the next stage of uh, dealings, yeah. Because we know to go abroad costs money as well, yeah. So, for example, like using this My Assist SME portal through MatchMe, you can do it virtually first. Maybe the next or sec uh, sec uh, the second round can meet it physically for a more better deeper understanding of your product or services, or even uh, not only uh, business or uh, mini trade, but also uh, technology uh, sharing, or perhaps to do uh, R&D with two parties, yeah? between two parties. So so that can be done through a uh, machine uh, module under our My Assist MSME portal. And last but not least, we also have a financial uh, assistance through uh, programs for uh, number one is GEB Galakan Export Bumi Putra. Another one is SME Go Global. Both will give uh, financial assistance in terms of buying machines, yeah? uh, preparing an office uh, outside Malaysia. Yeah, but very limited in terms of value, but something that can help the MSMEs to start with uh, before they expand their business perhaps getting more financial assistance like bigger loans. Yeah? So I think uh, with that, I thank you. Thank you. Now we open up to the floor. Any questions, clarifications, uh, suggestions you want to make? Yes. Yeah, maybe it's easy. Uh, my name is Juan Maimon, I have uh, one question and two observations. Number one is an observation. Um, during, uh, I'm in the construction industry. When a few years back, when uh, SP Sapir uh, won the Battersea project development, we were active until we realized that one of the conditions is SP Sapir cannot bring local consultant center for the practice. So we were very sad about that. I was wondering if the government, maybe we can make a donation to the government to assist and not have that kind of condition. Because the main reason why we have to go overseas is also the, the practice for that. We were so sad that only the big player, which is active there. We are very proud of justice. Again. But we will be more proud of if they can bring the small SME together. So I don't know whether it's a comment or a question or observation, but we hope that can be um, looked into. That's the first um, observation. 
Their second is a question from Cik Rita. I was wondering if SME Corp had some preferential or benefits for women as an Because we felt that it is a sort of a professional duty for SME Corp to give back preferential, preferential for women. But for two reasons. Number one, women agenda is a national agenda. And it is also an international agenda. We come in late in the business. So we need help. As Ms. Sivan Sivan said, ask for help. Ask questions. I'm asking questions. I'm asking help. But it's a big call. To see it as a national duty to give some benefit. Because what we want is just to be in the level playing field. We don't want to be better, but we are lower class. We want, we want help. So maybe as a call can be some preferential treatment to women. And, and the, the two reasons is women are about 49% population and we are very, very business minded. Thank you. Point taken. Wait, okay, thank you. The third one. The third one. Uh, because Ms. Sibon said, if you want to go over to ask questions, ask questions, ask for help. I'm asking for help from Dan Sino and Dr. Ingram. We have a small consultancy project in Africa. We do our business, we went, we went there, give services and all that. But the problem is getting our fee coming to Malaysia. We have problems in bringing the fee to Malaysia. So I don't know how to do it. We've been asking the bankers, the bankers say it's very difficult, the bankers are there and all that. So maybe I can get some advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll answer the women, <laughs> because that was that fit for SM4. Well, uh, perhaps I would like to share some statistics first about women entrepreneurs or MSMEs in Malaysia. I, I like to answer with numbers first and then we go uh, to the challenges and perhaps the, the solutions. Yeah? Okay, uh, in Malaysia, uh, as I mentioned just now, there are 1.22 million of MSMEs in Malaysia. Out of that 1.22 million of SMEs, or including micro enterprises, 20.6 percent yeah, uh, are women entrepreneurs are women SMEs. Okay, 20.6 percent. It's a significant number because it keeps growing every year. Yeah, women uh, women uh, grow in terms of the rate of uh, SMEs are higher than the normal SMEs or than men SMEs. Yeah? So we uh, we know that. Yeah. Uh, so we have emphasis on women programs and. Uh, uh, from, uh, as you know, SME Corp is also central coordinating agency, meaning that we uh, monitor as well as we report, yeah? as well as analyze all SME development programs, not only from SME Corp, but also from other 17 ministries in Malaysia and more than 60 agencies, government agencies in Malaysia. So in 2022, we have 230 SME development programs. A lot. Eh? Uh, uh, so, so out of the 213, 20 are specific for women program. Specific. 20, 213 open for all, but on top of that 230, 20 are only for women. So women are very special here. Because there is no specific men as an program. Only for all, yeah, we have 230 minus 20, but 20 is specific for women. And under SME Corp Malaysia, of course, we have programs like the grant that we give out, like VAP, PIP. we have uh, uh, few programs. I think you can actually look into our SME Corp website to know all the details of the program. But what I would like to share here, uh, remember the 20.6% of women ent entrepreneurs in Malaysia, in SME Corp, we give out our financial assistance as well as non-financial assistance, including training, more than that. 26%, almost 30% of the beneficiaries of our programs goes to women. So that's how important women to uh, to the economy. So, um, I, and we have specific women programs, for example, women entrepreneur program that we actually train uh, more than 2,000 of uh, SMEs, uh, women SMEs, not only looking just to train, but to make sure that they adopt digitalization and uh, e-commerce uh, as well as making sure that they operate their business online. Uh, that is for sure 
something that you are proud of as well. So uh, in terms of women, we, are, we take care so much of women. <laughs> Perhaps some of the men say, uh, this is gender bias. <laughs> there should be an equality in uh, men's the program as well. But we you know, uh, because of the growth uh, of women enterprises in, in Malaysia, uh, growing far better than the normal MSN, <coughs> that's why it is a significant numbers and contribution to the nation. Sure. I think the, from uh, Rizal's point of view, I think your questions are well answered. There are programs and uh, facilities to assist women entrepreneurs. Please go into their website and seek help. Just a 10 seconds addition <coughs> to that. Yeah. 10 seconds addition. You, have you heard of SJPP? This is a government a guarantee program, you can Google SJPP. They have a special working capital guarantee scheme up to one million ringgit for women. There's only women. And I think you can apply for that, that uh, loan scheme. The government will guarantee up to 80% of it. And of course, SME Corp can, can work on it. We can facilitate that. Yeah, it's been cut out under SJPP for women specifically. On the Battersea project, maybe Dr. Lingam can give some brief points. Thank you for the question. That is the same question when Battersea was being built. We were asking Battersea owners and we were also asking the Malaysian government, why is that? They gave contracts to local British lawyers, accountants, financiers, builders, suppliers, they never, never listen to us. And till today we have the grudge. And this is the battle we are always fighting. Why do our big giants come and give everything to local when their own people who are equally qualified, very successful, and give you 30% discount and better service because we are all qualified lawyers there. We practice there and we are very, very successful in our own right. But this is a psychological problem our people have and our politicians have. And this is something every time I meet our politicians, I convey it. But whether they listen or not, nothing much I can do. So. One of the things that we and the establishment can do is whenever they should lobby the government, if ever anything is going to happen in terms of investment or whatever, use our own local Malaysian talent who are practicing in that region, in that country. And unless, unless and until such directives come, I don't think they will. They all have this mindset, sorry to use the expression, the matsales are better, but you are talking to a guy who won a book prize with 62 matsales during my time in public international law. Thank so you. I have the same grudge, I'm sorry. Thank you. I think it's a common grudge. I think we will uh, probably have to bring it to the authorities' attention, you know, that uh, in future uh, this should be maybe uh, SME COP could play a role in bringing, and I will also see how through KSI we can communicate this to the government. On your banking issue, uh, you have to, when you have a contract with overseas, please make sure your bankers are aware of it and say that you have a contract and you will be expecting so much of advisory fee or revenue from there, and therefore you then, uh, because under AMLA nowadays the banks go crazy, they also I want to go through so many hurdles and I can understand your frustration. Discuss with your banker and if you have problems, write to the central bank and say that you have, you have a legitimate contract to bring in the fees into Malaysia is a problem for me. And I think we have overrun by five minutes. I'm sorry. Shall we give a, uh, our appreciation to the panelists? Uh, I know I, I, I could not take your question because we are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.